Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel, The Good Lieutenant. And I'm Vivi Ganeshanandan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel, Love Marriage. Sugi, I'm going to start off today by asking you a really loaded question. Really? What? How are you doing? And don't say I'm fine. <laughs> it's a loaded question. I uh, used to say I was pandemic fine. Um, and now I guess I'm developing new language for my situation. Uh, maybe I'm Minneapolis fine. I will take suggestions. Um, how are you? I think I said last week when we were, I mean, two weeks ago when we were recording uh, the podcast, and we're going to talk some about the circumstances of that later in the interview, that it was like the worst week that I remember in my lifetime in American history. And I do, I do feel that way uh, still. Um, you know, on, on the other hand, I am encouraged by the fact that these protests that have happened all over the country, starting in your city, but also happening in my city, are starting to get results that I hope will be lasting. Yeah, I mean, it's been very sad here, but it's also been amazingly transformative and to see kind of the spirit and resilience of the community around me, um, even as I think, you know, we mourn the murder of someone who died a mile and a half from my house. Um, it's been, it's been a unique vantage point for sure. Things are, and uh, I mean, I don't mind to sit here and say optimistic things, right? I, I think we have the, uh, you know, the worst president ever in the world and there's reasons why these protests have also seemed to be aimed at him in certain ways. And I think that's important. They feel like pro-democracy protests, but also protests against police brutality and, 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 and black lives and for black lives mattering. Um, for instance, one of the things that changed in Kansas City is a parks commissioner named Chris Good, who I spoke to just the other day, uh, recommended that this park where our protests were happening, J.C. Nichols, around J.C. Nichols Fountain, uh, be, have its name changed because J.C. Nichols was a real, white real estate developer who I wrote about in a novel that we've actually discussed on the show, you know, who used racial covenants to segregate the city. And finally, that idea of changing the name of that street has been able to come into the public consciousness, you know, 15 years later after writing that book. And, and that seems important. Those, are, those kind of changes matter. It does seem like uh, there's a move to ask people to make real change rather than making vague promises. And some organizations and individuals are taking concrete actions in that direction. I couldn't imagine doing this episode on anything but the protests following the killing of killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And now we're recording this on a Sunday morning, uh, Richard Brooks in Atlanta, which is news that happened on Friday night. Um, and the ongoing nationwide reckoning with racism. Later in the show, we will talk to poet and essayist Jabari Asim about how the media and literature portray the police. But first, we're joined by Sugi's University of Minnesota colleague, Terion Williamson, to talk about the view from Minneapolis. Terion is an associate professor of African American and African studies with a joint appointment in American studies. Her research and teaching specializations include Black feminist theory, 20th and 21st century African American literature, Black cultural studies, media studies, and racialized gender violence. She is also the author of Scandalize My Name, Black Feminist Practice and the Making of Black Social Life, and the director of the Black Midwest Initiative. She is also editor of the forthcoming anthology, Black in the Middle, an anthology of the Black Midwest. Terion, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. I really appreciate your being with us today. You and I both live in Minneapolis and we know its neighborhoods. And as my co-host keeps explaining to me, he does not. Um, I live in South Minneapolis, which is where George Floyd was killed about a mile and a half from my house at the intersection of 38th and Chicago. But you live in North Minneapolis, which was, uh, as far as I can tell, one of the areas most affected by the protests and things around it. So can you just describe your neighborhood a little bit for us, uh, for our listeners who don't know Minneapolis and for me who doesn't live there? Sure. So the way, so this will tell you something about North Minneapolis. When I was looking to move here in 2016, I bought a house when I moved here. I have family members um, who are uh, my father's age and my father's cousins who live here. And when I said I was looking to buy a house and I was looking in North Minneapolis, my cousin said, oh, you don't want to do that. All they do is shoot and kill in North Minneapolis. And so that told me, so I was like, oh, 
I guess that's probably where I should move because that must be where my people are, right? Like that told me something about what was happening in North Minneapolis. Turns out it's not true that all they do is shoot and kill in North Minneapolis, but it is the case that it's um, an under-resourced working class community of a sort that I'm really familiar with. About 50% of the population um, is Black or African American. And, you know, many of my neighbors are people of color and many of them are not, you know, the neighbors on both sides of me and in the front and behind me are all white. So it's a diverse neighborhood that has had its struggles as have many such neighborhoods. So Suki, what's the difference between North Minneapolis and, and some other neighborhoods you've mentioned to me, like South Minneapolis, where you live, and also George Floyd lived in St. Louis Park, which I also don't really know that much about. I wondered if I, both, either or both of you could talk about those neighborhoods. Sure. Um, so I, when I moved to Minneapolis, uh, moved to Uptown in part because I moved in great haste. And I moved essentially to an apartment building that another professor who had gone to high school with me had lived in. And so rather than searching for a place, I was like, Sarah lived here. It must be fine. Bingo. And um, as I moved there, also realized that I had sort of made a choice between living in an, an area that I felt like would give me as a person who had moved to Minneapolis without a car, um, an easy commute. Um, by public transportation, but in my opinion, the public transportation of Minneapolis is not very good and sort of segregated. And so I felt like I had picked between living with other people of color in a really more diverse neighborhood um, and living with good public transportation. So I lived in a very gentrified neighborhood and, and I then I moved to a slightly less gentrified neighborhood. Um, I live in sort of the west part of South Minneapolis and um, my neighborhood is mostly white. I'm one of the very few people of color on my block. And sort of as you go eastward in South Minneapolis towards Powderhorn Park, it becomes more diverse. Um, but there is, as, as Terry said, like a mixture of houses and uh, multi-unit housing, sometimes houses split into apartments here. I think Minneapolis is unusual compared to other urban areas in which I lived in that there are actually a lot of houses in a city, um, which I think as someone from the East Coast, when I moved here, I was like, whoa, there are, there are houses in this city. And, and renting has become more and more expensive in the time that I've been here. Housing is, buying a house in Minneapolis was comparatively, it was cheaper than other cities when I moved here. And those prices have been going up and up and up. Um, so, you know, and George, where George Floyd was killed um, at 38th in Chicago is east of, east of where I live. So one of the things about North Minneapolis too is that, it doesn't have the resources that other places have, right? So in terms of grocery stores, in terms of um, other kinds of, in terms of like restaurants and that sort of thing. So I'm a driver, so I don't have difficulty here, but if I was not a driver, it would be definitely more difficult here than in other parts of the cities to get, you know, essentials to get to a grocery store. So there's a, um, you know, there are certain parts of North that are on the verge of, if not already, are food deserts or on the verge of being food deserts. I do also remember, Sugi, the last time we were recording this podcast, you had to reschedule because, and you were nervous when I talked to you, you know, uh, you felt like there were some, there were white supremacists in your neighborhood and you were concerned about what's happening. This, that was the evening of May 30th. I wondered if both you and Terion could talk about your experiences during those early intense days of the protests. Like, what were you doing? What did you see? How did you feel? Terion, where were you, where were you when the protests were starting off? I mean, I was here, um, and it's it's the the bizarre thing about it is you're watching what's happening around you on television. Um, you know that became one of the ways of trying to keep track of what was happening, but it was also quite confusing because it took a while before I realized that there were, that there was um, protests that were happening here in, in North because everything, so much of the media, so much of the coverage was focused on Lake Street and South Minneapolis. And so, um, maybe that Friday or Saturday ap after that night, I went out just sort of driving around the neighborhood and I saw that the gas station right around the corner from me had been burned down. And I, I hadn't 
seen it. I hadn't smelled it. I hadn't heard it. Um, there were protests here in Kansas City also, but I have never seen a gas station burn down in my neighborhood. I mean, that would be, I'm sure that was, what did you feel like when you're like, oh my God, you know? Uh, yeah, it was just, I just <laughs> came up to the corner. Really, I could walk there and be there in, I don't know, four or five minutes, right? It's pretty close to me. And it was, it was alarming, <laughs> right? Um, especially because I had no clue, right? I didn't smell it or hear it or, or anything. Um, and so it was a lot, and that's when I first started getting a sense that, okay, things are also happening here in North. And then this is where, you know, the, the rumor mill has been churning. It's because part of the sort of question was about, like we haven't had the on the street um, sort of demonstrations of the sort that have been happening sort of near Cup Foods, right? Where the, where the murder took place. So it's like, why, what's happening up here that, that this is happening? And so some of those rumors about who was doing the, the, the burning, for instance, are circulating and it's still sort of hard to, hard to get a handle on it here. Yeah, it was, it was pretty weird. It's, I mean, it's curiously disembodied for some people, right? Like the distinction between, you know, because of the pandemic, so many people were in their houses or because of, you know, right. curfew or because of fear of whatever people who were in their houses had these curiously disembodied experiences of the protest from like, you know, I was basically glued to Unicorn Riot for five hours a night. It's, um, you know, like left-leaning media activists who have been running this nonprofit, which I think started in maybe 2013. And I think they just felt that mainstream media coverage of this sort of activism and also the violence attendant around it and the way that police were responding was not being covered. And so on Unicorn Riot, for example, um, in the protests, this mysterious figure emerged, Umbrella Man. Umbrella Man was responsible for breaking windows and, and sort of beginning some of the uh, quote unquote heavy quotes, looting and, and arson activity at an auto zone, which was one of the first places to kind of go. And so Umbrella Man became this like mythic figure in the discussion of the protest because he was carrying an umbrella, he was wearing a mask, he was white. Um, and a lot of people thought he was an undercover cop or something who had been sent out as, um, as like an agent of chaos. And so this was the sort of, right, like the sort of imagery and rhetoric and myth that was already building around it. And so, um, you know, I live in South Minneapolis. Um, I haven't talked that much about this in part because I feel like I don't want actually a, a, so a narrative of white supremacy to overtake what I feel like are the very important, primarily important actions of the protesters. Um, but I do live in a neighborhood where there was white supremacist activity. I'm one of the few people of color. I also have um, some family history of arson related things. And so I think was like after my several days of having watched Unicorn Ride until the dawn and having slept about two hours um, was not primed to like necessarily like stick it out in my house. Um, and there were reports also of things like in Terry and I, I, it seems like it was different in North, but around here it was like, you know, there were, for example, reports of things like you should search your bushes for bottles of gasoline. And then people living not super far from me did find those things, um, you know, abandoned vehicles, plateless vehicles, um, a real uptick in trucks, SUVs, motorcycles, um, plateless, plateless vehicles, and people who seemed to be gathering around paper maps um, per what some of my neighbors said and sort of planning things. And I think you know, one of my most trusted neighbors, who's a, another person of color, sort of said to me, they were using our neighborhood as a staging ground. I do know that um, the Minneapolis NAACP, for instance, was organizing at one point sort of what they were calling um, free, Minneapolis, Minnesota Freedom Riders or something like that, which was about um, people getting out in the community to help protect spaces that might be vulnerable to um, particular forms of people and spaces that might be particular um, vulnerable to particular forms of violence and that was spread throughout the city but also here here in north but I definitely wasn't hearing the same kinds of accounts like those you were you were hearing and so you recently published um, in belt magazine a piece about 
a, a piece examining the life and death of someone who grew up where you grew up and who died in Minneapolis. And I was wondering if you would read a little bit of that piece for us. The essay is called Remembering David Cornelius Smith. David Smith is a young man who was 28 years old. He was from my hometown of Peoria, Illinois, and he had ended up in the Twin Cities um, because he had come um, here for Job Corps. And so he was here for um, roughly 10 years or so. Um, after Job Corps, he stayed in the city and ended up being murdered here by the Minneapolis Police Department. I didn't know about this story until after the George Floyd killing happened. Someone who I had been good friends with actually when I was in grade school and high school had posted about um, her brother's death. David turned out to be her brother. Her name was Angela and she had posted something about his death. And that is how I first heard the story of David Cornelius Smith. We ended up talking and working um, together to tell the story of David. And that is what this piece is um, that I'm going to read a portion from now. I know Peoria Southside intimately as it is where I also grew up. And though I now live in North Minneapolis, it is the place I continue to call home. It is also where Angela and I met and became good friends while students at Treewind Middle School. I never got to know David personally, in part because Angela and I largely lost touch after she graduated from high school a year early. But when she told me David felt that he had to leave Peoria, I recognized the feeling from my own young adulthood. I left Peoria for college in Chicago shortly after I graduated from high school. But to be clear, David's leave taking was never meant to be an act of abandonment. He wanted to improve his financial circumstances so that he could eventually return home and help take care of his family. Like so many young and idealistic black men before him, he dreamed of buying his mother a house and moving her out of the hood. And so he moved to Minnesota. David applied to Job Corps and after being accepted into the Twin Cities program, picked up at the age of 17 and moved north. He spent three years in Job Corps and decided to remain in the area upon graduation because he was convinced there were still more opportunities for him there. He moved into his own apartment, had a long-term girlfriend and enrolled at Minnesota Community and Technical College where he took classes in business and political science. He also developed a relationship with a mentor at Penumbra Theater who helped him engage his love of acting and he even tried his hand at modeling because as Angela put it, people told him he was cute. According to Angela, David believed that a person could become anything they wanted in the Twin Cities and he, and he regularly tried to convince her that she should move there as well. Still, David began to struggle. What the family understood to be major depression was eventually diagnosed as bipolar disorder. The diagnosis remains controversial for David's family, some of whom were concerned that racial bias, not uncommon in the mental health profession, and David's lack of access to appropriate resources might have contributed to a misdiagnosis. Yet whatever their misgivings, David's family helped to get him the care he needed, which included getting on a regular diet and exercise regimen to help better manage his symptoms. That regimen is the reason he was in the downtown Minneapolis YMCA on the afternoon of September 9, 2010. According to most media accounts of the incident, the Minneapolis Police Department was summoned because David, who was typically described in these accounts as being, quote, mentally ill, or potentially under the influence of drugs or alcohol, was disturbing patrons in and around the sixth floor gym. It is not entirely clear what the exact behavior was that was supposedly disturbing patrons. Most accounts of the incident offer a vague assessment that David was, quote, acting bizarrely or being, quote, disruptive, while one account suggests that he was walking around shirtless and mumbling, that he threw a basketball into a kickball class, and that he, quote, scared a 13-year-old boy. According to Angela's understanding of the incident, the only disturbing behavior committed by David was that he was talking to himself while shooting jump shots in the gym. In any event, MPD officers Timothy Gorman and Timothy Callahan arrived and attempted to subdue David and remove him from the facility. As far as Angela knows, no one from the YMCA had approached David prior to calling the police. And given that he was a paid member of the club, he resisted the officer's attempts to make him leave. In the ensuing struggle, the officers used a taser on David multiple times, knocking him to the floor. 
They turned him face down and Gorman pressed his knees into David's back while Callahan restrained the bottom portion of his body using a tactic known as prone restraint, which restricts a person's ability to take in oxygen. The two officers held David down for more than four minutes. And when they finally released him, he was no longer breathing. Though paramedics eventually restarted his heart via CPR, David never regained consciousness. He remained in a coma until, we take, until being taken off of life support approximately a week later. David Cornelius Smith was declared dead on September 17, 2010. He was 28 years old. Thank you for reading that. Um, I'm sure it was extremely difficult to write, and I'm sure that it has been, it's just very difficult to imagine how his family must have felt when they heard about George Floyd's death, especially since, you know, when you read what happened to him, that the restraint, the asphyxiation, you know, these are all things that have been, that like, it's repeated, this thing is happening over and over and over again. Um, it's later in the essay, you talk about how it was part of the settlement around his death that the, that the Minneapolis Police Department would have training on restraints. That does not seem to have happened or there's no evidence that it did. So what is going on with the Minneapolis Police Department? Right. So that, that ends up being of critical importance for the family, right? So, um, so nothing happened to the police, the two police officers who were involved. They were put on administrative leave for a short period of time. Less than a month later, they were, they were back on their jobs. There was no, um, there, there was no sort of criminal indictment. And so the family sued um, city of Minneapolis and decided ultimately to enter into the settlement in part, in large part, because one of the things that they were told would happen was that the, there would be retraining around restraint tactics by, the, by MPD. That was very important for them because they thought, well, if there's anything we can do, because I, I guess the question was put to them, is it about change happening or is it about the money? And they were like, it's about change. We don't want anyone else to ever have to go through this. So it was vital to them that they were told that there was going to be all of this retraining that was going to happen around restraint tactics in the M MPD. So one of the things I mentioned later on in the article is that in a recent interview, Lewis Brown, who was one of the younger siblings of David, says, you know, my brother's death was supposed to save Mr. Floyd's life. And so when the video surfaced of what happened to Mr. Floyd and they had to watch that, it was really, as you might imagine, very triggering for them and devastating for them um, on a bunch of levels, just because, you know, what happened with their loved one is always sort of front of mind for them. But in, but the, the video, the circulation of the video, the particular form of restraint all was very familiar for them, right? And it just seems like the police department is basically their attitude up until now. And, and now I guess they're going to get disbanded, but it's, it's like, yeah, 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 we hear you. Oh yeah, we're going to fix things. And they just don't, they're just like, we're never doing that. You know, like, we, yeah, we'll just say we're doing it, but they just don't do it. Does yeah, and that, yeah, that, I'm sorry, that appears to be what happened in this case. And it seems like going back to what I was saying before about the city and the police, um, the police and the city have been very much at odds. You know, for example, the mayor tried to ban warrior style training for the MPD and via the police union, the police received that training anyway. So attempts to kind of rein them in um, have really been resisted by the union. And also here, in, and wait, I remember we were talking about this and you said in Kansas City, it's not the same. Like a lot of these police officers don't live in Minneapolis. Um, so they're not accountable to the community in the way that they might be if they were actually part of it, um, which also seems connected to this like bla flagrant flouting of this promise. Right. And I, I think it's also what this case in particular also reveals is how the MPD, like most police departments, is, are, are not able to deal with, um, are particularly unable to deal with mental illness, um, with health crises, um, people who they see as potentially under the influence 
all of that stuff is contested in this case, including the diagnosis around um, um, the mental health diagnosis of David Smith. But whatever the ultimate diagnosis was, it, they understood him to be in some form of a crisis. And clearly there's no ability to, to deal with that. And I think part of what it means to call for the abolishment of the police or to defund the police is to resource those, uh, to take those resources and put them elsewhere um, where they can be better activated by folks who know how to deal with people who are in potentially in one crisis or another. You know, Tarion, as you were, we were just talking about, um, you know, defunding the police, dismantling the police department, the city council has voted to dismantle it and, and has written a resolution to replace it with what they're calling a community-led public safety system. And we're expected to vote on a referendum in November. I was wondering what you think about that and the idea of that model as a replacement or, or evolution for safety and security in the community and, and where, we're, where we're headed from here. Yeah, you know, it's a little hard to know where we're headed. What I see happening is that there's going to be a lot of conversation about um, sort of the difference between defunding the police and abolishing the police and, and what it's going to mean to try to have those conversations in collaboration with each other. If you look, Miriam Kaba put out, um, has an opinion piece in the New York Times that came out a few days ago, which is like, yes. And she says, yes, we literally mean abolish the police. And just reading the sort of comment sections and the kind of instant sort of instantaneous rebuttal to that, I think is revealing of the way um, just, just a whole, in many instances, a wholesale rejection of that idea. And so I think that tells us something about the nature of the, the contestation that is to come around how to move forward. Yeah. Tarion, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about your experiences. Thank you, I really appreciate um, the opportunity. I look forward to continuing the conversation in person in some post-pandemic era. Thank you.